Welcome to this seminar on bold leadership for tomorrow's healthcare. We stand on a verge on a complete transformation of healthcare. Demographic changes, technological and scientific breakthroughs at a scale that we haven't seen before. We all believe that this will fundamentally redraw healthcare as we know it of today. And for sure, brave and committed leaders on all levels will be needed. And today you're going to meet three brave leaders from the different parts of the healthcare system. So I'd like to start introducing Marcus Lehmann, Chief Strategy Officer, Consulting Cardiologist and Adjunct Professor of Medicine. Welcome. Thank you. Mark Wolf, Chief Health and Life Science Strategist at SS Institute. Welcome. Thank you. And Anna Geirud Lander, Head of Operations and Management Support of the Health and Medical Care Department in Region Örebro. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, guys, I'd like to start asking you, what do you think characterizes a bold leader? What do you say, Marcus? Well, I would say that uh, a bold leader um, is a, a leader doing stuff. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, I, I would look, like to draw a parallel to back to my clinical days in the intensive care unit where, where uh, you have the patient in, uh, in front of you basically dying uh, and uh, not doing something is the worst case. So doing something, whatever it might be, uh, is, is needed to do under time pressure uh, and uh, going forward, doing what you think is best. Uh, that's kind of could be a description of, of bow leadership, even though it's um, more pressured forward. Uh, so it's it's not because you're bold, maybe, but you need to do something, mm -hmm. and and that's the way I think about bold leadership and within healthcare management as well, because we're under pressure from so many angles, and not doing something would be the worst standpoint. So, so it means that even if you don't know that this is the, the the best decision, you take the decision and you you actually act. Absolutely, because we're talking about your future and, and decisions are supposed to have their effects in the future and nobody can be certain about the future. So it's about always about probabilities uh, and, and acting on what you think is the highest probability. That's kind of bold leadership. Yeah. And, and some people think that you can actually foresee the future and you can do that with a probability uh, and, and you need to act on probabilities and, and part of all leadership i think is acting daring to act on in on uh, insecurity okay. what do you say you're nodding do you agree anna what do you think about bold leadership no i agree with what you say and i also think that uh, when i've been thinking about that that is daring to make complex situations simpler in order to see uh, and being able to take a decision and also daring to utilize your experience in that situation. Um, as Marcus said, this, this whole question is so complex mm -hmm. and we need to simplify it. Because when we also simplify it somehow, uh, it's easier to explain and for the surroundings also to understand. Another thing that is crucial i think is also to be able to or dare to admit i was wrong or we were wrong and stand up for that and discuss why um, never hide behind complexity never hide behind excuses that's bold so, so a bit of braveness in yes. a sense absolutely what and do you say sense. yeah what do you say mark I very much agree with 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 both of those descriptions. Um, I, I, at a personal level, I see it as um, it is easy to be part of a, a process where there is a established status quo, and sometimes those those processes are are fine; they work well. Uh, sometimes they they can be broken. But nevertheless, the status quo still exists, even though we all understand there, there's area for improvement. 
uh, because the inertia is so great, you can't break away from it. And to me, bold leadership would be that if you're in this sort of circular status quo, things are just moving around and around and people are more or less satisfied, even though they know it could be better or so on. Somebody who steps out of that, 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 that loop and just steps outside and says, the status quo maybe should be changed at this time, at this point to solve this problem, uh, to improve whatever that process is. It can be very small. It, it, it can be very incremental and it can still be bold. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, bold leadership is to move away from the status quo and to take a risk and a challenge to improve the process or whatever that process is. So we, we use the word bold, but bold can be small actions. The bold with small letters in a way. Yes. <laughs> Do you have an example when you believe that you, you actually practice bold leadership yourself, starting with you, Mark? So my, my background is as a scientist, uh, a, a researcher, and uh, I moved from, from, from the science of biology to the science of math. And today, my job is really to, to bring math to biology and, and, and try to translate how clinical decision support, how data-driven decision-making can be applied to very complex situations uh, in, in healthcare in particular. And these small incremental sort of um, actions around a particular problem where uh, clinicians were using intuition where cl clinicians were using incomplete data to make life and death decisions in real time, working with them and working to get them to trust the math mm -hmm. uh, and their own instincts. And at the end is, is a patient uh, who, who could potentially be severely uh, injured or, or die. Um, and then as a scientist and not as a doctor to step in and, and say, listen, I think I can help you. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's challenging. Mm -hmm. and, and that's I think, what you did? Yes, uh, so, in, in several cases yeah. where using monitors, uh, telemetry of, of, of a condition of a patient, and instead of just looking at the monitor, having the math translate what the monitor was saying and recommend to the doctor an action. Mm -hmm. That requires tremendous trust on the part of the clinician. Uh, that requires a level of confidence on the part <laughs> of the math. But to bring that together is a remarkable act, uh, and 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 can be, well, it can be quite scary. Uh, but when it when it occurs, going back to the earlier question, you feel like you've exited that loop, and you've moved the status quo to a new normal, where now that action is accepted as as part of the new normal, and hopefully that action saves lives and improves outcomes. I'd like to return later on how how these this kind of leadership will, are, is perceived or, or could be perceived. But uh, first, I'd like to hear from you, Marcus and Anna, uh, an example of bold leadership. I think you were sort of mentioning it in your first answer, Marcus, but if you go to yourself and your leadership. Uh, well, uh, I would say bringing data science into medicine and healthcare management, because those were areas of expertise that had basically never met before. And this was back in 2015 or so. Uh, and starting talking about advanced analytics, like made some people just walk away and <laughs> grab a coffee and, and, and others like, you're really, really weird, Marcus. Uh, and, and, but what we did was actually to increase transparency because we turn into data-driven uh, decision-making mm -hmm. on the clinical level gradually that's the most difficult part yes. but also on the on the managerial level how sh should we prioritize activities and encounters within our healthcare ecosystem and and actually uh increasing transparency is a scary thing because what happens is that you reveal all your bad sides or all the things you were not doing as well as you yourself thought you were uh, and uh, so it was like a culture tra uh, transition at the same time as we were uh, becoming more fact-based and actually some people in the senior uh, management leadership uh, left the boat because they 
weren't uh, happy with not having the world view, the view of, of, of activities, the world of, of the healthcare system they were ahead of, uh, bringing up, brought up into daylight. They didn't own the, the, uh, the story anymore. The, they didn't own the narrative because the narrative was in the data and everyone could see it. And, and draw their own conclusions. So going into data-driven or rather fact-based uh, healthcare management and, 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 and clinical decision-making is a scary transition. It uh, takes a bold leadership. Well, it takes much boldness and, and commitment and endurance and, and, and collaboration and, and trust and everything. But, but once you reach the other side, uh, then then you can start doing stuff mm. uh, and it's a much better place to be in. <laughs> That's a, a beautiful picture. And I, I, one could say that uh, Halal is in a way leading this <clears throat> transition in Sweden and you are is just about to start mm -hmm. your journey. Yeah. Uh, so being at the starting point, uh, do you, could you give some example of your own leadership? as I said, is bold because that's why you're here mm. starting this transition journey. Yeah. And then I have to go back mm. to 2014 when I entered healthcare because I myself is not a clinician either. Uh, I've been in the telecom and food industry. And when I entered uh, Karolinska University Hospital to start talking about these things, I learned, and now it's uh, I'm coming to being bold, I learned that I have uh, to have the network and the the connections and I what kind of competences and people do I need around me or we need to be a team I'm not the center it's the team that driving these things that is the crucial part and one of my first experiences is that I stood in a room like this in front of uh, quite a few uh, doctors and it was a very hard experience. <laughs> After that, I went out and I, <laughs> I, I, I thought, how can uh, we actually drive this? How can we do this in a much better way? Also to meet them on their level because I was not the clinician. So I teamed up with more people. Uh, and that's something I, I, all, I come back to. That was my first lesson within healthcare. We need the right team in order to do this. Jumping now to Örebro. That is also basically the essence. Um, what kind of competences do we need uh, in Region Örebro land and specifically within the healthcare, healthcare department in order to make uh, this transition? In Region Örebro, we have the uni uh, university in Örebro that is really good at AI and those kind of research. And we have the regional development department that is uh, building um, innovation systems, but within the healthcare, we, we have things to do in order to build up our abilities to be part of that system. We are one of the biggest users of uh, all the coming new technology, for example, but in order to be a, to you do that, we also need to understand what we uh, what we need and why, and we need to prepare ourselves. Um, so that is, well, a long answer to your question, what is boldness? That is, I guess, to um, for me, to understand what competences we need, to understand it's a team effort, and start there. Marcus was saying that uh, with starting to use data or data-driven decisions, mm -hmm. it also reveals, like... It, <clears throat> <clears throat> maybe bad decisions or 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 a culture that it's not longer valid and some people choose to leave because they don't like yeah. the, this new the new way have you felt the same that though being at the sort of starting mm -hmm. point that you working on on the using data mm -hmm. uh, will ne by necessity change the way we work mm -hmm. and not everyone is mm -hmm. going to be found of that. We are not there really mm -hmm. to so that people leave for this, I would say. We are right now understanding, okay, we know that we need to have our infrastructure uh, position so that we can have and extract 
put in the data in the correct way and extract the data so that we can utilize it for management uh, and even in, in, in uh, uh, patient person situations, etc. And so we are in that phase okay. right now. Uh, okay, we need to build the structure. We need to hire the uh, our abilities mm -hmm. within the organization. Uh, and that's quite a long journey to go. And we need to do that in parallel with all the technology that is out there happening right mm -hmm. now. And we are trying to use pieces of that but we, we fall out short unless we have the infrastructure. Of course. So, so maybe that step, if it's happening, is just to come. But I'd like to ask you, Mark, uh, listen to Marcus, is this a sort of normal uh, situation when you change the modus operandi or the way you use data that uh, eventually it has, to, it has a great influence on the culture, the way you work, et cetera? Well, I, I like the point you made, Marcus, about transparency. Uh, transparency can shine uh, a light on on the good, and of course expose also uh, what's what's not so good. Um, I'm 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 always fond of <clears throat> of citing a, a particular paper uh, that I think is quite important. It was uh, published in, in in the journal Science, and uh, it was the reasoning foundations of medical diagnosis. So how do we diagnose? Good paper. Uh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> um, and the punchline's even better. Three key issues from that paper, uh, that digital technology is of tremendous value to healthcare and medicine in particular, that there's concern that one should not give up decision making fully to computers, but there's an absolute understanding that uh, more precise diagnosis and more rapid understanding of the treatment path is the result of using digital technology. Uh, Reasoning Foundations of Medical Diagnosis, published in 1959. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, I challenge you, what I just told you could be today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we appreciate yeah. the value of digital technology. So were they so much ahead of their time in this analysis, or have no one listened since 1959? I think certainly what they concluded uh, it was 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 very prescient. It it, it saw the future. Yeah. Uh, it's also saw the concerns uh, uh, with moving towards this type of world. But I always saw it as let machines do what machines do well, to frankly free up humans to do what they do well. And I make a distinction between machine intelligence and human intelligence. And so when we were talking about uh, bold, and we we're talking about leadership, and I was talking about this this circular path of status quo, to an extent, that paper was addressing that issue. We, we're, we're, on, we're in the status quo that we've been for a very long time. And potentially, this is a generational change that it will take new clinicians and new healthcare professionals being trained in new ways. And we were discussing the other day, you know, I, I was giving a lecture at a, at, a, at a medical school a few years ago, and somebody said, well, when do you think this change will finally happen? And I said, two generations. Mm -hmm. I said, why did you say two generations? I said, when the Google babies are being trained in medicine, and they don't know a world without all the information at their fingertips or in their pocket, they will then train the next generation to, to, to live in that reality and to accept that technology as, as we accept the GPS for driving directions and we don't use maps anymore. And, and, and it'll happen. What do you say, Anna? No, I, I completely agree. And we discussed it yesterday a bit. Uh, and coming back to your earlier question, I think that people might be leaving today because they are frustrated that they don't get access. We are pushing in so much data into the system and we can't get them out. Mm. And that is really frustrating today. And Maybe that's why people, one of the reasons why people leave healthcare. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we, we don't have the information that we know is with, within that black hole somehow. What do you say, Marcus? Because you have managed to drive transformation without the Google babies because not, they're not old enough. They're not the tech doctors <laughs> <laughs> yet graduated. Uh, well, yes and no, but uh, mostly yes. Uh, and and. The thing is that not everyone, we are, we have like 
8,000 employees. Don't, they, not all of them need to understand the inner workings of, of data-driven decision-making or clinical decision-making. That's not possible, not within one generation or one med school uh, term, or, uh, but they need to trust it. Yes. Uh, and, and trust is what you build through good leadership and, and, and teaching and endurance, going back, listening, and it takes time. And, and what you actually do when you introduce data-driven or rather data-supported decision-making is that you challenge the way humans think and, and the way humans make decisions. And, and when you embrace uh, data-driven the uh, the uh, the complexity of healthcare or the human being, uh, the human biology from a data driven standpoint, then you understand that hey, this is super hard. How could we ever make decisions about this stuff before we had these tools? Uh, because we as humans, we don't have the bandwidth to to crunch all that information. So we go on uh, intuition or other like. Uh, workarounds. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> yeah. Good work. And, and they are immensely flawed by bias, like cognitive yeah. bias and cultural bias. And, mm -hmm. and there are hundreds of types of biases. And what you want to, uh, to do is to explain how how the uh, the models, the algorithms, the uh, the data can help them understand their own biases so that they can make more correct decisions and I see that as a support and not a threat uh, and and as long as you don't understand it it might be perceived as a threat but once you understand that hey we we actually made some be better decisions that this group of patients is actually faring a bit better now they get the medications according to guidelines in a bit better way two percent better or five percent better that's that's a gain and that's how you start building trust in a new modus operandi uh or and, and it takes time so and and working with our uh Bruno is is super nice because we made a bunch of errors not understanding those challenges ahead uh, and we paid tax money for making those uh, uh, errors but we learned so much along the way uh, and what what one thing we learned is that the humans and the technique the uh, technical side need to evolve together so you can have like a consulting team buy them uh, and, and say hey digitalize us uh, and, and, and go in and do it and, and uh, implement 10 cool algos and, and go out and we will follow up and see that patients live longer. And I, I can guarantee you not one patient will live one day longer uh, because the system will not be used or trusted. And, 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 and we're back in the human or 100% human decision making. So it needs to be like uh, evolved in, in, in parallel. And that takes time. Anna. And not just in parallel, it needs to be developed. Yeah. Not sure of the word, but together, you know, integrated, right? Yeah, merged. Because, emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, because the reality uh, is that we have a situation where the health, the healthcare is really pressed, pressed. Uh, it's high pressures and lots of ongoing daily work. And how can we fit that in? <laughs> Jumping in with a consultancy firm is not the answer, as you say. But we need, and that's the trick, to evolve and emerge together with the everyday ongoing operations. And how do we build trust in that? Uh, trust with the, with the doctors, trust with the nurses that are the ones that, we, that needs to be part of this as well. I'd like to go to uh, also to be... A little bit even more specific what data-driven decision how it could change healthcare systems mm -hmm. and what actually are the great changes uh, compared to yesterday so starting with you mark from an international pers perspective could you give us some examples what actually is possible using data and of course uh, with the right leadership yes so my my work involves understanding how 
uh, mathematical approaches to decision making uh, can be brought in through software and technology. Um, and on the healthcare side, what I have seen really is, is two areas of focus. Uh, one, and I think Marcus, you alluded to it, is operational analytics. And the other is, is clinical decision support and clinical analytics. I think um, the operational analytics area is of, of profound value and opportunity. And um, it often is, I think, the, the faster path towards value in applying analytics. So for example, issues of patient flow. Uh, how does a patient move through a care continuum? Uh, how can you understand to make that path more efficient, uh, minimize wait times, uh, then address staffing issues as, as, as a means of patient flow, optimize a surgical suite utilization whilst maximizing safety and minimizing infection and so on. So just the operational aspects of delivering healthcare the logistics, if you will, the supply chain aspect of it, every other industry pretty much has attempted and successfully addressed that issue with technology. And this is a very important word, automation, where humans aren't making every single decision about every single sort of commodity decision, not life and death decision, but these what I call commodity decisions. So applying analytics to uh, optimization, patient flow, minimizing wait time, um, uh, surgical suites, as I mentioned, staffing optimization. I, we did a project in a neonative intensive care unit. We simply analyzed discreetly every minute of every day of how, how the babies moved through the unit, how they interacted with the staff. And we discovered something completely counterintuitive. The, the traditional thinking was get those babies out of there as soon as possible and get them out of this unit because that will improve outcomes. Our data showed and our modeling that two extra days for a specific baby at a gestational age would not only improve the outcome, but reduce the cost of care. Wow. That was completely counterintuitive to the status quo. And using mathematics and modeling, we not only allowed the doctors to, to convince the administrators that those babies should spend two extra days in the unit, but that that would save money and improve outcomes. And as a result, you could optimize your staffing. And how was easy or difficult was it to implement these? So to use the data and change the way they work? Once the experiment showed absolute practical human value, and was validated both mathematically and practically. So the, the, the trust issue was taken care of. Uh, that implementation was easy. That unit now functions based on those models. And what is really exciting, these are learning models. So what I mean by that is that with every new baby, mm -hmm. we put those data back into the analysis and rebuild the analysis. So now that analysis is sensitive for a particular baby that may have been an outlier. So in a way, the system learns, remembers, but does not make decisions necessarily. It simply provides this is the best possible probability of treatment at this point and allows the human to focus in on a much narrower decision set, which saves time and increases, I think, accuracy. So the example was a very practical one. The key was trust, validating that example with the clinicians and the administrators. And we started at an operational level, simply the logistics of that unit, and then eventually moved to the clinical level. It, it's a wonderful example. Yeah. How long did that take? How long time? <sighs> a few months. Okay. A few months. We, we collected a lot of data from other hospitals mm -hmm. and other neonative intensive care units. And what was a challenge, again, Marcus, you've brought up so many good points, was we actually had to collect data from units that were poorly performing. So we would understand what the negatives are of certain actions. And then we understood data from units that were performing very well. And by performing, I mean good outcomes uh, uh, for the patients. Mm -hmm. And when we brought those data together and then we modeled what were the optimum paths along that baby's flow through the unit, we realized that in particular cases, extra time, counterintuitive, produced better outcomes. And most incredibly, the baby, uh, the care of the baby costs less. Mm -hmm. So a few months of work, mm -hmm. um, very rigorous validation against real world data, and then continuous improvement of the model with every new baby. Another question? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> because what, what, 
what you're describing now is a very successful example. Absolutely. And also how you somehow manage to get around because sharing data, et cetera, is one of the obstacles that yes. we're continuously discussing. That's the reality. But you seem to have within a research project or... So we were working with um, a very well-known uh, hospital uh, in the U.S. Uh, associated with Duke University in, mm -hmm. in, in the state of North Carolina. So uh, my, I, I work out of North Carolina, so there's a local connection. Mm -hmm. So it always helps when, when there's a local uh, kind of, um, it, it, it overcomes certain barriers. Um, we were doing something that everybody understood would be very valuable if successful. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a level of co collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, given again, Marcus, to the point you made about complexity and of, 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 of clinical decisioning and, 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 and medicine itself, we focused on a very discreet um, problem. Mm -hmm. This unit, mm -hmm has a uh, has an entrance the babies come in based on certain criteria and has an exit and and it's either transfer death or or discharge so we had a very constrained ability to focus on 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 modeling that unit it wasn't the whole hospital it wasn't everything no. that went on and that's important take a small bite take a small bite do it well and then take that experience, build trust, mm -hmm. build confidence, and go on to the next one. I know you've done something similar within cardiology. And I don't know the, the, the term in, in <coughs> English, but Hjertsvikt. Well, yes. Um, well, we have or, done many, wrong? yeah, absolutely, many academic papers mm -hmm. uh, and, and practical analytics in operational uh, healthcare in, in parallel. But I would like to just stress that most of what we are aiming at is better precision. So you 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 made the example of some babies needing to be back in, 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 held back in the war right. and some going home. Exactly. And it's all about uh, increasing the precision in order to get the be better return on investment. So what we do in in healthcare traditionally and uh, and still today is to we treat you as a part of a group uh and, and we have guidelines that are on the group level and and what we do is uh we calculate what we call numbers needed to treat or numbers needed to admit to get one success story uh and we cannot afford treating groups any longer not in precision healthcare or precision medicine we need to uh, to treat the individual who has the highest chance of benefiting from the encounter or the treatment or, or, or the investigation or whatever. Uh, and I would like to just provide another example of what happens when you really look into the individualism and, and challenge the dogmas, challenge the way you think healthcare uh, is run. And that uh, is... Uh, talking about the four-hour goal at the emergency department. Uh, that, that's an, uh, a UK idea from, from the beginning saying, hey, no, no person should spend more time, more, more than four hours in, in, in the emergency department. Then uh, if it's longer, it's, it's, uh, you need to do something about it. And what happens is that when you're under stress in the emergency department as a physician, deciding physician, uh, what you do to avoid the bad four hours numbers is you admit the patient and, and let somebody else do the radiology workup and uh, et cetera. And the resource intensity, re resource utilization is like four or five times as high in the emergency in the ward than in the emergency department uh, in, ter in terms of resources utilized per hour. Uh, so what we did was to skip the four-hour goal and say, hey, we don't care what the national government says about our, our reaching that four-hour goal because it's a stupid goal that, uh, that, that throws away resources and, and, and uh, sometimes um, injures patients because inpatient care is more dangerous than outpatient care also. So uh, we, 
we pulled away based on fact, based on trust. We, we provided the data and discussed the data with the emergency physicians and say, hey, this is the new logic. Let's try this. If it doesn't work, we'll go back. We'll, we'll say we're sorry uh, and, uh, and we will uh, go back to the uh, old system. Uh, and I can tell you, we will never go back to the old system. <laughs> but you make it sound very easy because this is, uh, I mean, everyone knows that in Sweden that uh, spending too many hours in the emergency department, that's really scandalous and, and you'll have the, a bad headline. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you get the politicians on board? Was it just saying, let's skip this? Uh, well, this was not the first project we did. Uh, so <laughs> Soften them up with something else. And no, it, uh, and that's why I, I return to endurance. Uh, building trust in, is not only among clinicians and managers, it's also about senior uh, politicians and policymakers uh, and making sure that they are always involved, understanding, trying, being able to scrutinize, have their questions and everything uh, makes puts you in a position where you can actually uh, try stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and as long as you control the test and say, hey, we will back immediately if we say that, if we see in data that we, it's not leading in the direction we're going. So being able to not following up. So I hate the word follow up stuff because it's like looking in the retrospect, but monitoring mm -hmm. in real time. Is it going, are the curves turning? Is it mm -hmm. going better? Are patients being injured or are they living longer or, or whatever? And you follow those and not from, and this is the second no-no, key performance indicators. Oh my <laughs> God, those are so dangerous. Because what you do is you look at three performances, but you forget all everything else. Uh, so you need to look at 100 or 200 aspects of, of the ED work and see uh, if there are any indirect negative consequences of your of your decisions. And if you see that, you immediately uh, tweak your decision. And that's why that's why turning from uh, retrospect medicine or retrospect decision making into today and future oriented sort of predictive medicine. Instead. And that's why you'd need predictive modeling. Yes because you need to predict uh, the risk for, uh, for different alternatives in the future and then act on those alternatives instead of uh, looking back and saying, hey, we did this in 10 years ago, it's, we should do, do this again. Does it take other skills from doctors to understand these models, to moderate and understand <clears throat> when to act or not? We, uh, we dip our new doctors into this thinking day one when they enter the hospital this is how we work uh we tell them and so it's not a problem with new new doctors they're so used to this yeah. and and uh and the old do, ones maybe have to take several dips <laughs> two or three <laughs> yeah. uh, or, or eight or yeah. hundred but uh, Continuously. uh yeah basically but the new doctors they are they expect us to do this right. so so they would uh, see us as uh, like leadership as obsolete if we didn't uh, individualize, use predictive analytics. <laughs> they go home and they get their Netflix suggestions mm -hmm. and, and they want to go to work and get their uh, uh, ch choice of pharmaceutical to pres prescribe uh, presented in a super simple way and they just go click yes mm. or uh, click no because blah blah blah, uh, and and so that that's when you when you get to take away the the in uncertainty and help them with uncertainty because that's what you what what feels in your stomach when you work with uh, with patients is uncertainty about the future. Uh, if you can support them with uncertainty, then they can turn their focus to the patient instead and ask the patient what's important to you what matters to you we have these alternatives the prognosis is this on this uh and 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 okay i want to be we don't want your i don't want your super duper uh, very good uh expensive pharmaceutical because it makes me feel shit and i don't want to feel shit during christmas because this might be my last christmas mm -hmm. with my grandchildren mm -hmm. so i would rather 
rather live a month shorter, but feel well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the patient's decision, but at, la at least we know now what options mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a way, a world of a difference from, from the way we used to work, where we said, hey, you had this cancer, you belong to this group of cancers. This is your guideline recommended treatment. This is your reimbursement system because you have this uh, kind of, of healthcare plan. Uh, so this is your option. Have a good day. <laughs> uh, and that's where we don't want to be. Uh, Anna, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I really like that when you say that new doctors are being deep. Mm -hmm. We are not there. And, that, and learning and listening to uh, your examples, what we are doing in Örebro now is, you know, giving every one we are, we are planning now an educational or discussion sessions that will last for over a year so that we can meet and discuss from top management and bottom up about this so we are on a different base but we're aiming at that because i i don't think that we can skip that because if we jump to the solutions directly we will fail utterly we have to um, hire, yeah, we, we have to have that discussion internally for a long time and also to be able to develop together with, all, with our physicians and managers how we will do this in another room. Mm -hmm. Just, um, I wanted to maybe give another international perspective <laughs> here. So my job really is to, is to try to understand where uh, some sophisticated analysis can add value. Um, and particularly, as we've been discussing here in the healthcare space, I spend a tremendous amount of time, particularly in the Nordics, um, uh, because I find that uh, there is a much more aggressive, in a good way, mm -hmm. and a much more thoughtful consideration of the consequences of not acting. Uh, whether it's uh, aging populations with chronic diseases and comorbidities, whether it's maintaining quality of care against those pressures, mm. uh, whether it's uh, maintaining quality of care and access to care against the pressures of staffing today. And, and again, what I mentioned. So I, I feel that the Nordics in particular uh, are very thoughtful and advanced thinking, uh, looking to see where are we going to be 5, 10, 20 years from now, and how can technology not only maintain uh, the quality of care we provide, but uh, improve and improve access. I don't see that in other places in the world. Uh, and and you know, in the US, uh, the, the, the famous statistics of, uh, we have some of the highest technology medicine, but it doesn't correlate at all with, with the outcomes that it generates vis-a-vis -vis cost. It's a completely inverse situation. So why? You know, technology alone doesn't solve the problem. But I think what is happening in, in Sweden and in, in Denmark, uh, in those countries, is remarkable. And so, you know, I, I go where the opportunity is. And <laughs> oh, that's why you're here. <laughs> that's why I'm here. I'd, I'd like to, to sort of uh, end this uh, very interesting discussion with talking about the future. If this transition works out, if, if a new way of work actually are being implemented in healthcare on a, on a greater scale, what are your visions? And, and you, you can share any vision you like. What could this accomplish? Um, starting with you, Anna, if you describe your vision. Uh, with the healthcare, the future healthcare system. Well, it's again, it's. Uh, um, I think that we will provide healthcare in a very different way and building the infrastructure and the ground with data is crucial for that. I think that the hospitals will be much more highly specialized. I think that healthcare will be out there uh, in people's home, much more in the primary care, but much more in the people's home. I think that preventive care uh, will be much more focused on. And I also... I, I think and I hope because we need to solve the money issue with moving from, from hospital care to primary care to preventive care. Uh, I also see that we have lots of more um, predictions in order to be able to focus where should we work much more actively preventive. The backside of that 
and this is what really, what scares me sometimes is that um, we might see a, a, a wider gap yeah. uh, in our ability to take care of all the, the people uh, who are the ones that have access to all the, the uh, gadgets and stuff in order to be uh, uh, work preventive, etc. No, so, but back to your question, um, I see a much more not so hospital focused care, uh, much more um, responsibility for the ones that can take it for their own health care. Marcus? What's your vision? Is it well, I would say the patients are ready. <laughs> the patient organization are chasing us, making us go farther and, and faster. Yeah. Uh, and then I will, I'm seeing us ending up or ending, there's no end to it, but like uh, eventually going into a healthcare ecosystem with different providers who actually yeah. are part of the same network from a patient perspective. So they, they travel between. Um, uh, providers and, and encounters, but they don't even know they're traveling and they don't even uh, understand that they are different providers because they are seamlessly integrated into each other and the, the, the glue is information. Uh, and so there is an information-based ecosystem of healthcare that is always predictive, so uh, acting on the future. Uh, and, and we're going there, and, and the result of all of this is, will be a big yawn, because it, it, it will happen gradually. So, so when we're there, everyone will say, well, okay. Now we're here uh, because that's what's happened. Uh, and we have like super scientific uh, uh, treatments today uh, that 10 years ago was like, like uh, Star Trek. Uh, and, and we give them like this. Oh, well, this is your treatment. Have a good day. And it's target seeking nanomolecules <laughs> based on uh, and re guided by some 3D uh, uh, re resonance imaging. It's so super high tech, you wouldn't believe it. And, and we go to work and say, well, it's a good way. It's a good day at work. And, and, and that will be the case in, in the, after like the revolution as well. It's, it will be see, uh, looked upon as something <coughs> normal, uh, even though it's, it's uh, like, tremendously different from what we see today. Mark, your vision, and maybe also Anna brought up some possible uh, negative effects. Do you see any of them? Or is the future so, only bright? Never is only bright. <laughs> there's, there's, there's always something behind the curtain. Um, well, vision, I, I think my hope, uh, because I think this would be perhaps one of the most fundamentally important changes if you, I'll use an example. If you look at the world financial system, uh, I landed at the airport in, in Copenhagen. I stuck my North Carolina bank card into the machine. Mm -hmm. Money came out in the denomination I wanted. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. That should be the same with healthcare. If I go to a hospital here, I should be able to stick my card in a machine and my health record is there. My health information is there, uh, even the financial implications of how I'm covered by whom, so on and so forth. The financial world has a global data model, and we all understand what interest is. We all understand what the, what the uh, rate of exchange is, and so on and so forth. Healthcare does not have a global data model. Uh, in Sweden, you have these amazing registries, you know, birth to death. We talked about that. How are they being used? to support decision-making. Uh, how, how do those data correspond and correlate to my data today in a transaction at the hospital? I use the term transaction because I'm kind of mixing the metaphor between finance and, 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 and healthcare. So my vision, my hope is that we finally reach, I guess in the US we call it interoperability, where we have a, 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 a common language that's global and that understands our diagnosis that understands the treatment from country to country, from hospital to hospital. I think at that level, if we could have that common language, tremendous benefit will simply come from that. Um, 
of course, once you start talking about uh, that, then then security issues come in. No, my data can't move across the border. Your data has to stay here. Uh, those, I think, to me, are not only cultural and societal issues, they're legislative issues that can be uh, accomplished through um, legislative fiat. One day the law says this, the next day it says that, right? So the, the opportunity is a global healthcare data model that allows the exchange of information for more efficiency in the healthcare system. And then the danger is the obstacles that 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 regulatory security and government uh, issues can can stop that. I don't know what the answer is, but but that's my hope that that we get there because once we're there, analysis, data, reporting, KPIs, all that become better. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, Mark, and Marcus, thank you so much for a very interesting conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.